This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 54 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on the homestead journey. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And before we jump into this week's homestead happenings, I did want to give a shout out to a listener from Seattle by the name of Andrash. Andrash? I'm not sure 100% on the pronunciation, but I received a really, really great email from Andrash this week. Andrash is someone who grew up in Hungary, as I understand from their email, but now lives in Seattle. And the reason why they contacted me, if you remember back in episode number 40, I recorded an episode regarding using the whole chicken, and I entitled it Beak to Butt. And in that, I mentioned a dish from Hungary And I'm not even going to try to pronounce it again. Uh, Andras did walk me through the pronunciation, but I'm just not even going to try to go there. I'm just going to call it rooster testicle stew. (laughs) Now, Andras, and I'm not sure if that's a, I think it's a male name. So I probably will use male pronouns. If I'm wrong, I apologize, Andras. But Andras did say that my pronunciation was understandable. At least he could recognize it. So I guess it wasn't too badly mashed up. (laughs) But anyhow, Andra shared with me some, just some great stories with regards to how he grew up in Hungary and some of the food that he grew up eating and how his grandmother used the entirety of the chicken. And so I thought I would just read a section of that email because I just found it so fascinating. So this is what Andras said. I also wanted to share what I remember from my childhood regarding eating chickens beak to butt. My grandparents on my mother's side were basically homesteaders, but as you mentioned on your show, for earlier generations, this was simply the way of life and labeling it wouldn't have made sense to them. They had chickens, one to two pigs, garden with veggies, some fruit trees, and berry bushes, geese at some point, a land to produce corn and a vineyard. When my grandma processed a chicken, she would save the blood too. They had no kill cones. One person held the chicken by the wings and legs, and she cut the throat of the chicken and let the blood into some container, usually a small soup bowl. She put it in the fridge, and the next morning when it became jelly-like, she cut it up into smaller pieces and prepared it with scrambled eggs. I remember not wanting to eat it initially, but after I tasted it, it was okay, so I ate it. Guts and lungs went to the cats. My mother told me their current cats are so accustomed to cat food, they don't eat it anymore. But I remember one of my tasks was when helping my grandma with the chicken processing is to keep the cats away because they were so much into it. Other internal parts, heart, gizzard, kidney, liver, testicles, and comb, if it was a rooster, went into a soup along with the head, neck, back, and feet of the chicken. The breast and thighs were battered and deep fried. Since there were so few of the internal parts, it was prized, and usually the children ate them. I love the heart and gizzards. My brother ate the liver, and usually I had the comb. Kidneys and testicles we shared with my brother. The feet have that soft, cushiony bump. I never had that. Usually my mother ate it. Eating the neck is indeed a bit bothersome. But I like that meat no matter how little it is. And we made a contest who can keep the spinal cord in one piece when pulling away the cervicals. And we ate it at the end. Last thing is the head. It was cooked in the soup and cracked open with a strong knife. And then the kids ate the brain. I loved it, but I didn't like the fact that often little shards from the skull remained in it and pricked my tongue. So I sometimes skipped it. As for the soup, it was like a broth. 
Besides the chicken, you add carrot, celery root, onion, kohlrabi, turnip, and you cooked it for a couple of hours. Then using a strainer, you filter out the solid parts and serve the liquid and the veggies separately so everyone can have what they want without having to find it in the pot. You also add angel hair pasta to the soup when serving each person. Once the soup course is done, comes the meat and other stuff from the soup as the next course. Finally, you eat the deep fried battered thighs and breast with potatoes and pickles and finish the lunch with some pie or other dessert baked by my grandma. This is how our typical Sunday lunch with grandparents look like. Wow, just describing it is amazing and brings back so many memories. I hope you enjoyed and didn't gross out too much on the blood. Well, Andrash, I absolutely enjoyed those stories. And quite frankly, I got a little hungry. Now, honestly, I'm not sure about the blood. Although maybe when I butcher chicken the next time around, I may give it a whirl and catch some of the blood and try doing some scrambled eggs that way. But honestly, I probably won't. <laughs> but honestly, I found that so fascinating. And I really, really enjoyed that walk down memory lane with you. And so thank you so much for sharing that with me. And I hope other people enjoy that story as much as I did. It's one of those things, as I said, and I don't want to rehash that entire episode, but as Americans, and I generally speak as if I am speaking to Americans since like 98% of my downloads come from the United States, but as Americans, we have gotten away from eating those, you know, the awful, as they recall it, or awful, I'm not sure. People think that awful is awful. I don't know. <laughs> but the things like the heart and gizzard and kidney and liver and, and all of those kinds of things. And people around the world, not only do they eat it, but they enjoy it. And so thank you again, Andrash, for, for sharing that story with me. I really enjoyed it. Now, Andrash is doing some homesteading in a very small way. They're doing some raised beds in their backyard. They have a plot in the community garden and they're canning some stuff. And so what are they doing? They're doing the best they can with what they've got. And I love to hear that. And so I just want to encourage you, Andrash, keep up the good work. And I just hope that this podcast continues to be a source of encouragement to you on your journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance and sustainability. But you have no idea how much that email meant to me and what it has done to really offer me some encouragement to keep doing what I'm doing. Anyhow, folks, let's jump on over to this week's Homestead Happenings and I will bring you up to date with what we've been doing here on 3B Farm and Homestead. So here on 3B Farm and Homestead, this week we spent quite a bit of time getting ready for winter. And we did that through a number of different things. First of all, we spent some time cleaning out the raised bed gardens. And folks, what I discovered is I didn't do quite as good of a job keeping ahead of the weeds as I thought I had. In fact, we had a plantain infestation that I didn't realize. I just didn't realize it was quite as bad as it was until we started pulling things out of the garden. And then it was why it was just very apparent that we had that really throughout many of the raised beds. But I even had some burdock root. Can you imagine how in the world did I allow that to take root in our raised beds? But I did. I was able to get out most of it, but unfortunately I think some of it broke off. So I'll have to keep an eye out for that next year that it will try to grow back up through. And that's a pain in the neck to get out of the bed. But the biggest problem were those darn trellises. <laughs> now I love them. I use cattle panels. If you're new to the show, I use cattle panels for trellises for my beans and for my tomatoes and things like that. And they work great, but when beans grow up them, they so get entwined in that, it's such a pain in the neck to get them off. And the same way with the tomatoes, you're just having to rip things off. Now, in all fairness, any trellis that you use would have that kind of a situation. And it's probably easier. In fact, I know it is easier 
to get the beans and the tomato vines off of the cattle panel trellises than it was when I was using the trellises that Mel Bartholomew recommended in his square foot gardening book. So it, it still is easier than that, but uh, it's still not a joy. <laughs> so we spent quite a bit of time this week out in the garden working on that, getting cleaned up and ready for spring. I also spent some time this week carting wood chips around. Now, the last couple of weeks, we've had more rain probably in the last couple of weeks than we had all summer, to be honest with you. It was a very, very dry summer for us. And the dryness of the summer was actually a benefit when it comes to my pigs because I didn't have to provide as many wood chips to my pigs as I normally have to. But this week, my son and I were carting some wood chips around. In fact, the mama pig and the babies that I had down over the hill in quarantine there, they really rooted that pen up in ways that none of the other pigs have ever rooted that pen up. And I discovered that that area down, there's a lot of clay in that, in that dirt down there. And so it just really turned it with that combined with that rain that we had this week just really turned it into a slicky a slick snotty mess and so i hit it with some wood chips got to hit it with some more but i'm very thankful that the wood chips are not that far away down at the town barn so we can drive the tractor down there with a truck and get three four scoops of wood chips in the truck and bring them up and it makes it pretty darn convenient this week, I also started weaning the piglets. Now, if you remember last week, I was sharing with you how I had done some castration of the piglets, and then I try to leave them about a week with the mom before I start the weaning process. And it may all be in my head, but I just like, I like knowing that the piglets have the comfort of mom and they can get some milk after, well, they've had their testicles literally torn out. It sucks. It's such a horrible process. I, I just hate it. But so we started weaning the piglets this weekend. And as part of that, the pen where I was going to put them, one piece of fence, there was just an area where they could have squeezed underneath it. And so I got in the pen with some board to kind of close that gap. And what I'm using is is some quarter inch chipboard that we had cut in the shape of waves for the float that we put into a parade last year. My son's Boy Scout um, troop put it into this parade. And so this chipboard is really not good for anything else. It's, I don't know another time when I'm gonna need something in the shape of waves. And so I figured that it would work well because I could bend it to the form that I needed I also understand that it's going to deteriorate rather rapidly, but my thought process is that by the time it fully falls apart, the piglets will have grown to such a size that they're not going to be able to scoot underneath that fence. I, that's my hope. Now, if they scoot underneath that fence, they're not getting out of the pig area. They're just going from one paddock to another. So anyhow, I was out there drilling holes in that, to attach it to the fencing with some zip ties. And as I bent over, my pants happened to sag a little bit as they have a tendency to do, exposing a little bit of that old plumber's crack, if you know what I'm talking about. Well, one of those pigs decided to come on over and investigate. And let me tell you something, folks, you get a pig snout shoved into your butt crack and that'll wake you up. Woo-wee, I tell you, that was a bit of a, an uncomfortable situation there. But uh, anyhow, so we've got uh, the piglets in the process of being weaned. I've got two more piglets to pull off tomorrow. What I like to do with my piglets when I'm weaning them is I pull them off usually a couple at a time so that the mother can dry off and hopefully not end up with some mastitis. This week, I also upgraded the garage lights. Now, in our garage, we just had some screw-in uh, light bulbs and it was always very dim out there. Troy over at Red Tool House a couple of months ago recommended some screw-in LED lights and so I reached out to him this week 
got the details. I went ahead and ordered those lights. And let me tell you something, folks. I am not happy with Troy. And the reason why I'm not happy with Troy, and I let him know this, is because now I can see exactly how much junk I need to clean up in that garage. <laughs> oh my goodness. I thought, as I shared with you last week, that I was really ahead of the game. But boy, I tell you what, putting those lights out there has really, well, it's illuminated how bad of a pack rat I am. And how bad I just have a tendency to drop things where I, well, maybe shouldn't drop them. And so i got to get my butt in gear and get back into the garage and get some things cleaned up. But no, it is looking nice out there. And I, I really do like these lights. I'll go ahead and put a link in our uh, Amazon shop. So you can find that at thehomesteadjourney.net slash shop. If you're interested in getting some screw-in LED lights, let me tell you something, folks. They really, really light things up. Let me also provide you with an update on Boris. Boris is really settling in well, and he has really calmed down quite a bit. I, I can't quite pet him yet without having food present, but uh, I can now pet him without him running away and getting skittish and jumping back. So we're making steps there. He's also starting to follow the bucket, and uh, when I go to dump the bucket in his pen with the food, I lean over and I try to get it so that he's starting to put his nose up in the bucket. So again, he's understanding that good things come in buckets. So that if he gets out, maybe when he gets out, I can hopefully get him to get back to where he needs to be. That's at least the plan. Finally, this week was a huge milestone here on 3B Farm and Homestead. And that is my son turned 16. And so he got his permit. And he is driving me around now. He is my chauffeur. Doing very, very well, I have to admit. But it is, it's a bit odd sitting over in the passenger seat with my little baby boy, who's not quite so little and not quite so baby anymore, but he's still my boy. <laughs> but with him behind the wheel, it's just an odd, odd feeling. And I remember back when, I think it was even before he was born when Bonnie was still pregnant with him, people would say to me, Brian, don't blink. You'll miss it. You don't quite get that until you're heading towards the end of the journey. And not to say it's the end of the journey, folks. I know it's not. But you know what I'm saying. From the standpoint of in a few years, he's going to be out of the house, off to college, whatever. And... It seems like yesterday we brought him home from the hospital. If you are someone who has young kids and you're listening to this podcast, remember that they are far more important than any homestead. And I'm not trying to minimize homesteading whatsoever. I think that raising kids on a homestead is a very, very positive thing. In fact, for him, the fact is he's been driving our farm truck up and down the driveway for a while now he's been driving the tractor up and down the road for a while now so for him to get behind the wheel of a car he already had a leg up because he was raised in a homestead mm -hmm. but folks just remember the important things and make sure that you give your kids priority one of the things i promised myself before brian j was ever born and that was that I would never wish away a day. No matter how frustrating it got, I would never wish away a day. And up to this point, now I know he's only 16. <laughs> There's some more days ahead of us. But up to this point, even in the midst of COVID, us being quarantined together, God has helped me keep my promise to myself that I've never wished away a day. Because I know there's coming a day, and it'll be here sooner than I want it to be. When I'm going to wish that little snot-nosed brat was in the room at the end of the hall. So just keep that in mind, folks. If you've got little ones still at home, love and cherish them and spend as much time together with them as you can. You won't regret it. All right, let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. One of the 
Most common questions I am seeing in the Facebook groups and homesteading forums, well, it, it kind of goes like this. Help, I just closed on my new homestead. Where do I start? Now, let me first start by saying this. It is natural and normal to feel a bit overwhelmed at this point. You've had these dreams of having a homestead and these dreams are starting to become realized and reality sets in. And quite frankly, I don't think it matters whether or not you are brand new to homesteading or you're somebody who maybe for one reason or another is relocated to another piece of property. Maybe you decided that you needed more land or for whatever reason, COVID has forced you to relocate. I don't know, but you may be an experienced homesteader and you still may all of a sudden feel a bit overwhelmed and you're, you almost freeze up this kind of this thought of where do I start? I've got so much to do and then you can't do anything. My first piece of advice is simply this. Take a deep breath. Homesteading is a marathon. It is not a sprint. And the temptation is going to be there to try to do too much. You want to raise all the things. You want to grow all the things. You want to do all the things. But take a deep breath. Physically and figuratively, but take a deep breath. Do not try to do too much. If you do, you are going to overwhelm yourself physically. You're going to overwhelm yourself mentally. You're going to overwhelm yourself emotionally. And you're probably going to overwhelm yourself financially. And if you do that, what you're going to end up doing is short-circuiting your homestead journey. You're going to end up burning out. And you're going to end up quitting. So take a deep breath. The second thing I want you to realize is that there really is no, besides maybe my advice to take a deep breath, there is no first step that applies to every homesteader. There is no five step or 10 step easy plan to follow on how to establish a successful homestead. Now, I wish there were. I, I wish there were because it would make it so easy. But unfortunately, there isn't. And honestly, when I say I wish there were, be careful what you wish for. You see, the beauty of homesteading is that every homestead is different. Where you buy your homestead may impact, it probably will impact, what you should do first. What you should do first on a piece of property in California could be very different than what you should do first on a piece of property in Maine. What you should do first on a piece of property in a suburban lot may be very different than what you should do first on a piece of property or a homestead in the country. What you should do first on a piece of property that's in an HOA is certainly going to be vastly different than on a piece of property that is not in an HOA. Every homestead is different. But you know, you could have land side by side in the exact same area, and both pieces of property are going to be different. The sun might shine slightly differently. The trees might be slightly different. The soil composition could be very different. The way the wind blows and the sun shines and the shade falls, how the infrastructure is laid out, all of that could be very different on two pieces of property that are side by side. But let's just imagine for a moment that somewhere in the universe, there are two pieces of property that are exactly the same. Exactly the same shape, exactly the same layout, exactly the same soil composition, exactly the same infrastructure, everything is exactly the same. 
those homesteads are still different because the people on those homesteads are different. What interests you, what drives you, what has drawn you to homesteading could be and probably is different than what interests me and what drew me to homesteading. And there's nothing at all wrong with that. In fact, that, again, in my opinion, is the beauty of homesteading, is that you get to do the things that are of interest to you and to pursue the things that are of interest to you, to grow and to raise the things that are of interest to you, and I get to do the same for the things that interest me. And so every homestead is unique because the people on those homesteads are unique. unique. And therefore, apart from me simply saying to you, your first step should be take a deep breath, everything else can be and probably will be different. But not just that, when you buy your homestead can also help inform what your first step should be. So it would be very crazy of me To sit here and to say, well, if you bought a homestead, the first thing you need to do is plant a garden. The second thing you need to do is get chickens. The third thing you need to do is get pigs. The fourth thing you need to do is run water lines to water the gardens and to water the chickens and to water the pigs. If you just bought your homestead in upstate New York in the middle of January. You see, in the middle of January in upstate New York, for those of you who are not familiar with this area, we probably will have a foot of snow on the ground. That's not exactly the optimal time to be establishing a garden, (laughs) to be getting chicks, to be getting piglets, to be running water lines. That's not the right time of the year to do that. So keep that in mind. Everyone's homesteading journey is different in part because where your homestead is, the land on which you are homesteading, the people, and when you buy your homestead, all of that is going to impact what you should do first. Having said that, though, there are a few other things that I think do apply, at least in a general sense, to, if not every homestead, many homesteads, if you are just starting out. So after you take your deep breath, The next thing I would say to you is don't do a whole heck of a lot that's going to be permanent. Instead, take the first year and really spend that time observing your land. How does the wind blow? How does the sun shine? How does the water flow? How does the shade fall? Observe your land. And the reason why I say to take a year to do that before you establish too much that would be considered permanent infrastructure is because how the wind blows and the sun shines and the water flows and the shade falls in January is probably going to be very different than how the wind blows and the water flows and the shade falls and the sun shines in June, which is going to be much different than how the wind blows and the water flows and the shade falls and the sun shines in November. And it goes on and on and on. So you want to have about four seasons of observation under your belt before you do a whole heck of a lot that would require the installation of or building of permanent infrastructure. So spend about a year observing your land. Now that doesn't mean that you sit and do nothing on your homestead. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm simply saying that before you invest an incredible amount of time and effort and energy and money into building that beautiful chicken coop in the area that you you think that chicken coop should be, you may end up finding that that area gets very swampy. Or maybe that area is the area where you wish you would have put your garden. So just be careful during that first year my recommendation is to really spend a year making observations about your land before you get too crazy about 
building or installing permanent infrastructure. But one year is just that, one year. And you could have had a dry summer or you could have had a wet spring. And so not everything that you observe in one year is going to be all of the information that you need. And so that's why it's very, very important that you begin to establish relationships with your neighbors or with local people as best you can. Trying to find other homesteaders, other gardeners, people who are involved in some of the same things that you're involved in but they're in your local area. Now, getting to know your neighbors and if you can, establishing positive, good relationships with your neighbors, I think is very important. We have a great relationship with our neighbors here. We're very, very lucky in that regard. And so if I need some help doing something, my neighbor will come over and help me or I will go over and help my neighbor. Uh, if I go on vacation, my neighbors on both sides have come over and helped take care of my animals. I've done the same thing for them. So having that kind of a relationship is very, very helpful. But I also understand that's not always going to be in the cards. But to try to at least establish some kinds of relationships with people locally, especially if you are relocating from a totally different area, I think it's going to be invaluable. If you're relocating to North Carolina from California, or you're relocating to Maine from Florida, or you're relocating to Tennessee from New York, you are coming into an area where the growing seasons are different than what you're used to. The weather patterns are different than what you're used to. And while certainly taking that year and observing how your land works, I think is very important, trying to tap into the knowledge of the local people I think is going to be invaluable for you in the pursuit of a successful homestead. Also from the local people you can learn maybe places where they might recommend that you source supplies, where you can get feed, where you can get cheap building supplies. But I also want to say this to you. One of the things that I have seen happen over and over and over again is I've seen people who are very, very passionate and excited about homesteading come into a local area thinking that because they read the books by Joel Salatin or Elliot Coleman and so on and so forth, that they knew more, way more than what they did. Now, I'm not banging on... Joel Salatin's book. In fact, I just bought his recent Polyface Designs book. I'm excited about it. I've read his other books. Very, very helpful. I've read Elliot Coleman's books, and they're very helpful. But you need to understand that what may work on Joel Salatin's farm may not work in upstate New York. And so I can learn from people who have been gardening and people who have been raising animals in this area, and while I may be excited about all of the Joel Salatin stuff and permaculture stuff, it doesn't mean that I can't learn from people who practice maybe what we might think of as quote-unquote traditional or conventional agriculture. You don't want to come into a situation and start making enemies and thinking that because you read these books that you all of a sudden know it all. Trust me, folks, that's not a great way to win friends and influence people. And we have that happen here, quite frankly, in upstate New York a lot, where people will come up, and sorry, those of you who are from New York City, I, I love you, but I don't. <laughs> we have a love-hate relationship with people like that. And it's not just necessarily even just in the homesteading sphere. But people will come up from New York City and they think they know way more than those of us who are locals. And trust me, folks, that does not lend itself well to creating a great working relationship. Every area has its own unique culture. And you need to understand that. You may be an American, but if you relocate from California to North Carolina, trust me when I tell you this, that the culture in North Carolina is vastly different than the culture in California, and I've never lived in either place. But I will guarantee you that it is. 
The culture of upstate New York is vastly different than the culture of downstate New York. I promise you that it is. And so you need to understand the culture of your, your area. Now, you, you may say, well, Brian, what does that have to do with establishing a successful homestead? Well, if you want to have a successful homestead, you are going to need to work with and to interact with people from your area. Otherwise, it's not going to be a very pleasant experience because one of the things that we've talked about is that homesteading is, it's about community. So all of that to say, meet friends, neighbors, other homesteaders, but be willing to listen and learn from everyone. Even if they might garden differently than you envision or raise animals differently than you would, you still can learn from those people and resist the urge to tell them how they ought to do things, even though you, quite frankly, might be right. The next thing that I would tell you is that at this point, you probably already have a list of things that you'd like to try and learn. But if you don't, then make that list. So do you want to learn how to garden? Do you want to learn how to container garden? Or do you want to learn the roost out method? Do you want to learn how to preserve food? Do you want to learn how to ferment food? Put a list of things that you would like to try to learn and then prioritize that list. Because again, folks, the temptation is to try to do it all. And if you have never preserved food before, then if you're going to try to learn how to freeze and to can and dehydrate and to ferment, you're probably going to overwhelm yourself. So from that list, choose one or two things that would be appropriate to the time of the year that you are starting your homestead. So if you are someone who is starting your homestead journey, you've bought a homestead, you're moving onto the property in the middle of January, that's not going to be the time for you to learn how to raise chicks. Uh, it's not going to be a good time if you're in upstate New York. Now, if you're in California, that may be a perfect time for you to do that. So you want to do what is going to make sense based on the time of the year that you are starting your homestead journey. But you're only going to want to choose one or two things and learn those one or two things well. But also start small. If this is the first time that you've raised chickens, you probably don't want to go out and buy 200 meat birds. Probably not going to be a good idea. So if you're starting, this is the first time you've ever raised meat chickens, then you might want to start with 15 or 20. If this is the first time you've ever raised chickens, then you might want to start with a dozen. If this is the first time you've ever raised goats, you might start with one or two. If it's the first time you've ever raised pigs, probably a pair of feeders is a good idea. Don't just jump in and say, well, I, got a, I can get a great deal buying in bulk, so let me go out and buy 300 chicks. Bad idea. Pick a couple of things, but start small so that you realize successes and then build on those successes as you journey. So I hope you find this helpful. Certainly it is not as easy as here is a list of the five steps that you need to take to establish a successful homestead. I wish it were that simple. But if there is one step that everyone should take, it's simply take a deep breath and remember Homesteading is a marathon. It's not a sprint. All right, everyone, that is it for this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast. If you've enjoyed it, I would love to hear from you. You can do as Andres did, and you can send me an email, brian at thehomesteadjourney.net. I would love to hear from you. You can also reach out to us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, MeWe, Reddit. YouTube, the links to all of that is in the show notes. Also, if you are interested in supporting the show, you can do so in a number of different ways. First of all, simply share the show with other people. I would greatly appreciate that. Secondly, 
jump on over to iTunes or your favorite podcasting platform and leave us a review, a thumbs up, five stars, whatever the platform allows. Finally, if you go over to thehomesteadjourney.net slash shop, there is a list of links. There are affiliate links over to Amazon. These are products that we use here on 3B Farm and Homestead. If you find it on that list, it's not just that we've bought it. We like it and we recommend it. One last thing before I wrap it up for today, and that is that we are coming up on the one year anniversary of the Homestead Journey podcast. Can you believe that? One year ago, coming up in November, we started this journey together, and I thank you so much. If you've been with me since the beginning, I just really appreciate it. If you're relatively new, I'm glad you found us. But we are going to have some great giveaways and some exciting things coming up. I've got some things that I in the works that I'm experimenting with. And so in the month of November, we will be talking about all of that. So you're not going to want to miss an episode. Not that you ever would. But some exciting things coming up here in November to celebrate one year of the Homestead Journey podcast. As always, folks, the music on this episode was provided by Audionautics.com, so a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.